on air 24-7. This is today's News Talk Radio, TNT. Welcome back. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to TNT, today's News Talk. I'm Patrick Henningsen, your host. Thank you very much for rejoining us on this live broadcast. We're in the second hour. Uh, We've got a lot of ground to cover. We're going now internationally, specifically to the Middle East. The crisis uh, in Gaza right now is unfolding at a rate that is, quite frankly, horrific. Uh, A lot of people, including journalists, are having trouble keeping up with it uh, just because of the sheer volume of the images and the reports coming out. It makes it very difficult to show and analyze everything. Suffice to say, uh, you've all been watching this story since October 7th and is really just unbelievable. But uh, the humanitarian uh, backlash, if you will, hasn't fully hit. It's already a humanitarian crisis, but it could get a lot worse in the next coming weeks and months. I want to welcome onto the program our next guest. She is definitely a, an advocate for uh, human rights and for trying to bring some kind of resolution and aid to this situation right now that we're seeing in Gaza. Let's welcome to the program Hala Hanina is joining us right now. Hala, thank you for coming on today's News Talk. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Hala. I'm doing now a PhD in sociology and politics. I'm a social and political activist. I'm a fourth generation uh, refugee from the Nakba survivors in 1948. And my family are refugees in Gaza now. My father is originally from Beit Hanin al Quds, Jerusalem. My mother is from Iraq, Sudan. And um, now I'm in the UK doing my third year of PhD. However, all my family, uh, siblings, my husband, friends, everyone I love are still. Uh, besieged in Gaza, where Israel is committing a genocide against all of them. Yeah, it is a it is a dire situation. I don't need to tell you, uh, Hala, how bad it is. But um, if you could, if you will, uh, explain to our audience um, the, the put this put this in context. We've seen uh, Gaza come under attack in previous years, in two thousand and eight, uh, two thousand twelve, two thousand fourteen, many many times. Operation Cast Lead, Protective Edge, all of these have been absolute catastrophes. Put this current situation into historical perspective, if you will. Okay. Uh, For myself, just talking personally, um, my family were living outside Gaza for a while uh, for jobs. And in 2005, we came to to a visit to Gaza and um, Israel dismantled their illegal settlements from uh, inside Gaza, but kept their occupation on Gaza. And because of that, we were um, um, uh, strictly inside Gaza, uh, we were blocked inside it until the official blocked by Israel was um, uh, announced. And since that time, in 2008, I was only 12. I was doing my Arabic exam, just finished it, waiting for my friends to go back home. And then suddenly, the hell opened up into our souls. It was the first time for me to see something like that. Palestine have been occupied by Israel since 1948. However, this amount of bombardment and like ongoing genocide that was committed against us started in 2008 with more than 20, uh, 250 uh, bombardment that Israel hit on us in the first hour in 2008 in December. And since that day, Israel have bombarded us each few years or each year. And in the last three years, it was like each few months. So before October the 7th, Israel um, bombarded people in Gaza in May. So this is not the first time in 2023, but people don't care about that because Palestinians have been the people who were killed. And that's very annoying. Like just to remember since 2008 until 2020, uh, 23 before this current genocide, Israel killed in Gaza only more than 7,000 lives. And that's enormous amount, that's that's a lot, but nobody cared about us. And that's very painful. And we left that pain for us so, so long. And people were just ignoring what's happening to us. And I hope in this time, people would have realized that their silence over the genocide that was ongoing with the Palestinians for more than 75 years uh, had actually led to the reality we're living now in a genocide and and like the most the most strict blockade we've ever faced. 
the, 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 the hardest famine in the world, where each five most hungry people in the world, four of them are now in Gaza. And this like one month ago, so not now. Now it's much worse. And at the same time, there's no medication, there is no anesthesia to treat the people. And Israel is literally doing two things. At the first thing, they are committing something they always call them carpet bombing. So they bombard the whole area and the grass moaning. So they make sure that there is no life at that area. And at the, so they kill and demolish. But at the same time, they do something very important, specifically at, at this genocide, which is um, the, the, the total demolishing and mass demolishing of all infrastructure. And that's very important for Israel and their eradication of the Palestinians, because there's a strategy called um, bomb now, die later. So they kill us now, they killed more than 33,000 people, 13,000 of them are children. And at the same time, they make the atmosphere and infrastructure and circumstances where more thousands of people will be dying because of the bombardments and how they strategically prepare the situation for our death. With infectious disease increasing for, for about a million now, we're 2.3 uh, million in Gaza, 1 million of us are children. Now, people with infectious diseases are, are about a million. Uh, more than 90% of the population are starved and not because we're poor or we lack resources, no, because Israel denied all of that and bombarded all the resources that we have. So not, not only that, uh, Hala, the, the maternity wards, lack of access uh, for uh, pregnant expecting mothers, it's, it's just not there. They're not able to provide those services to everybody. Um, so that's a huge risk. The, uh, all these things, Hala, go against uh, the ruling that South Africa had in the International Courts of Justice. They said cease all activities which are uh, you know, deemed to be genocidal, i.e. Article 2 in the International Courts of Justice and the Genocide convention they violate they're viol they're continuing to violate this so this is a really an unprecedented situation uh that's unfolding and uh, who, who is is anybody coming in to step in to sort of say hey uh this has to stop um is there any indication politically is there any america europe canada is anybody willing to willing to intervene politically or otherwise um unfortunately we as Palestinians have felt that all the time. We've been alone. We've been left to suffer by ourselves and to use whatever types of anything just to survive. Um, however, for the first time in our life, South Africa was the first country that stood to the justice and to the right. And they have taken Israel to, because of their committing of a genocide to the court, to the ICJ, International Criminal uh, Justice Court. And with that, we know about the complicity of the world, the, um, the European countries, and so many people who have like a veto or else at the UN. So we're not very optimistic. However, for the first time in life to feel that there is a country in your back, it's something that we have never felt. So we're very thankful to South Africa. However, at the same time, we're very disappointed with so many countries, among them the UK, US and others, who are still until now backing the, the genocide committed by Israel on Gaza. They haven't abided by international law and the ICJ call for immediate ceasefire now and for a total cease of all genocidal acts. Israel didn't do that. Those countries, US, UK, many European countries, didn't push them to do that. And worse of all of that, in the middle of this like political and humanitarian catastrophe, those countries have actually stopped their aid to the UNRWA, which is the only humanitarian agency that is able a little bit to work inside Gaza and to like for, for a little bit to ease the situation. Not a lot because Israel doesn't allow a lot of aid to go in, but they are trying. And now those countries who should be abiding by the ICJ and international law are actually punishing Palestinians more for having a decision by international law that Israel is a genocidal, um, a genocidal state or a genocidal colony. 
uh, talking about the women um, who are going to the uh, labor world and all of that, just to put in context, we have now more than 60,000 Palestinian women uh, uh, could be delivering at any second, uh, like pregnant women. And uh, in the last four months, almost four months now, um, 20,000 babies have been delivered. And those babies have been delivered from those women at the worst circumstances. C-sections, so caesarean operations have been operated on women without anesthetic. Not because we don't know how to use it, not because our women are used on being opened the seven layers of their body and the womb without anesthesia. No, because Israel denied anesthetics. Even in the small aid tracks that entered Gaza, Israel removed the anesthetics and the antibiotics and other stuff. So multiple women, thousands of women have done anesthetics, um, uh, caesarea without anesthesia. Multiple babies have died because of the lack of um, good natal, uh, postnatal care. Multiple women had to have, um, you know, after I have a friend and they have been trying to, to have a baby since 10 years. And finally, they had like, she was pregnant before this genocide. And she had to, um, she she had to take like um, daily um, injections, a medical injection because of her situation. And she wasn't allowed to move. And she was in Gaza. And when Israel forced them to move to the south, she had to move for like multiple kilometers, which caused her to bleed. And then she went to the hospital. She was able to bring the baby, but the baby wasn't in a good situation. He wasn't fit. And at the same time, she had postpartum hemorrhage, which is a normal complication after birth. However, because Israel denies us the anti-hemorrhage materials, doctors had to remove all of her uterus. So now in her first birth, she become infertile. Why? Because Israel would like to eradicate Palestinians, not just by killing them and bombing and dying, but also by preventing Palestinian women from birth and killing children in of cold and uh, lack of hygiene and hunger and all of that. So the situation is is getting way worse and at 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 the at the level where it's getting to unimaginable level of pain, those countries that should be the leading countries, the abiding with the human rights countries, which they don't, are actually cutting aid from the only agency that would provide people with the little bit of aid that could help them to survive. And, and I'm going to add to this uh, shocking scenes, uh, Hala, uh, where Israeli settlers and Israeli citizens have mobilized to block aid coming into Gaza. I mean, this is just unbelievable. So there's absolutely no one restraining anybody doing any of these activities. Uh, and again, this is in violation of the South Africa's uh, interim ruling uh, from the ICJ on this. So that that is just incredible. I mean, I don't see any condemnation of this really uh, in the United States and the media. Um, normally, they would say, they'd contact Tel Aviv and say, this doesn't look good. You know, you need to deal with these uh these crazy settlers but no one it, uh, that doesn't seem to happen they've actually increased the 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 people mobilizing to block the aid coming in i mean this is inc this is crazy uh hala you, is, you've never yeah. seen anything like this we've never seen anything like this no this is like literally a terrorist attack of all levels from the um, from the genocide campaign over gaza with the execution of people 30 people were found executed today and, um, and somewhere in the middle area. Israel have actually executed them, put them and went. And others like women and others were found in the uh, labor room at Shifa hospital. They were also executed, live execution. And it happened to so many people around Gaza. And at the same time, blocking aid is another form of war crimes. And not just that, Israel is also denying more than 65,000 injured Palestinians from leaving Gaza to be treated. We don't have treatments in sight. Our doctors, nurses, and all medical staff have been working for four months now, day and night, being killed, being bombarded, being besieged, losing their whole families, and still working with no basic material to work. 
there is no gloves, there is no medication, there is no anesthetics, there is no sterilization, there's no hospitals. They just fix anything in the hospital and go back to work. Because Israel have almost um, partially or totally demolished all of our hospitals and damaged them. So with, with having all of that done by Israel, they at the same time prevent the severely injured people from like more than 6,000 now must leave immediately or they would die. But they don't allow them even to go out for treatment at other places that is welcoming them coming for treatment. And until now, like it's four months now, Israel only allowed 700 from the 65,000 to go out for treatment. And also the cancer patients, my friend just sent me, his mom is so sick. Um, she should have done a surgery in October, early October. She hadn't done it. Now she has metastasis. Uh, her situation is getting worse, but they can't even treat her inside Gaza because Israel bombarded the only hospital for cancer patients in Gaza. And now her and 10,000 other patients are suffering from the lack of treatment and ability to reach um, uh, medication or to go out to have uh, medical service outside because Israel doesn't allow them even to do to do that. So, so what you're saying, Hala, is that even if 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 Israel stopped uh, bombing today, um, the, the the wave of excess deaths in Gaza will continue to rise um, over the next months, in fact, or even years, perhaps. Uh, is is that the is that the reality of the situation or? How yeah, and it? I think it's not something that happened like as a byproduct. I think it's designed. It's part of everything that Israel have uh, put us in since like so many years. But just to mention the blockade, they have put the situation where people would have more diseases, more issues, more complications, lack of resources and unemployment. However, in this genocide, they have they have done something they haven't even done in Nakba. In this genocide, in this four months, Israel killed more than the double that they killed in Nakba in 1948. They have evicted more than the double they evicted in 1948. In 1948, they evicted more than 800,000. Now they evicted more than 1,930,000 or even more. This is the at least numbers that we, we know. And at the same time, they have totally demolished all the infrastructure for, uh, for uh, treatment. So there's no hospitals, there's no clinics at all, there's no medication, no antibiotics. People with chronic diseases are just dying because they can't go any place to be treated. People with dialysis or like renal failure, they need daily dialysis. They are also dying because they can't have uh, treatment. And not just that, children who can't find uh, food, water, like good water, are having infectious diseases and they are also dying. And women with like pregnancy and need of um, a lot of care, they are dying in delivery because they are not delivering in good situation. For instance, a friend of mine told me that her cousin had to deliver uh, in home because uh, it was uh, besieged by the Israeli occupation, by tanks, uh, the, the home where she's staying. And after like hours of everyone trying to deliver her, they did it successfully. She survived, the baby survived, but they didn't have a scissor to cut the um, um, the cord, the, imbi yeah. the umbilical cord, yes. Yeah, yeah. They couldn't cut it. So she had, after that, after the besieged ended, the tanks moved, she had to walk one and a half hour after delivery immediately to the nearest clinic to have that cut and to have a postnatal care. You can imagine what's a postnatal care in the most crowded places where hundreds and thousands of injured are coming in with their, with their families. So Israel have literally, literally done types of genocides. I didn't read even about it. There is more than 33,000 people who are killed, 13,000 children who are already killed. We're talking about more than 65 people who are injured 9,000 of them are amputated, one or two limbs, which is something we haven't seen. 1,000 of those 9,000 are children who had the amputations without anesthesia. And we know some of them with names. It's shocking, it's hurting, it's very painful, but still going on. All of those, like the people with the chronic diseases, the people with injuries, uh, the infectious diseases, and not to, to, to forget, at the third month, Israel have bombarded Gaza with more than two Hiroshima bombs and with a lot of unlawful 
white phosphorus. This will bring to Palestinians in Gaza a lot of cancer disease, a lot of other diseases that we're not aware of. And collectively, with lack of total infrastructure, no institutions, no one's working, no one's eating or providing food, people would be bombed now and they will be dying later. And uh, and also, do you, do you have any indication uh, about any potential possibility of, of resuming aid deliveries? Are there any negotiations taking place now? Uh, is there any sort of back and forth going on between the various countries and uh, and the government uh, in, in Gaza as well? Is there any anything in, on the horizon, uh, Hala? Like the strongest thing that have ever happened was the UN resolution, uh, the UN Council, um voting over aid on into gaza which spent like a week of um uh going forth and going back because they didn't agree on the on the written version and at the end they voted like the un had to vote to give people food and after they did that they started to try um to deliver food to people but it didn't even work so i don't have any optimism in the world now the world is allowing a genocide to happen. The world is allowing 2.3 at least million people with 1 million of them are children to be starving to death, to be dying of cold, of wet. It's winter now in Gaza. It's very cold. It's a coastal place. Uh, people are living in tents. Some of them, not all of them. Many of my friends, they don't have access to tents, actually. And the world is just sitting aside and watching what's happening. People are our investment. They're great. Everyone's going out. They're refusing the genocide that televised in front of all of them. However, governments are very disappointing. And that made me understand that those Western countries are not actually democratic. Because if it's democratic, then the good people and their will would be represented by the governments, but they are not. So it's not a uh, it's they are not democratic countries. People are good, governments are bad, and that's why we're still in the genocide for the fourth month. We're, we still have no aid, and we have lost all of our infrastructure for the fourth month until now. And just personally, I haven't seen my parents, my siblings, my beloved husband, and all my friends and family in law since four months. And it's something so painful. I miss all of them. I, I can't imagine staying months away of them, not to mention while they are actually facing a genocide. There's something for the Palestinians. You know, people in Gaza and Palestinians have always been creative. We always try to have any sort of um, control of our lives, even if Israel was literally trying to control everything. So because we had like um, other six aggressions and genocidal campaigns before this one, we have developed something. Um, it's a choice. So multiple families, because we know that Israel massacres and wipe out all like families together. So families started to think and decide and they, they divided to two, two types. One type is the people who decide to stay together in one room, stick all around each other in the bombardment, so if something happened to them, all of them would die together and no one would stay to mourn the rest of the family. The other type of people who are actually choosing to, to be separated, so statistically, if Israel bombarded, bombarded multiple areas, maybe some of them would survive. I was from the first type of families. My family always stayed together. So if something happened, it happened to all of us. However, since I'm here, and the first time in a genocidal campaign over Gaza, I lost this privilege. It's shocking that it's a privilege, but for me it is. Because I've seen losing this privilege, what does it mean? A friend of mine who's been here suffering from the same thing I was imagining, on the 22nd of October, 2 a.m., because we don't sleep at night, we watch the news because Israel increases the bombardments at nights, I read the name of his family, an out family, and I sent him, Ahmed, are you doing okay? And he didn't respond. For the first time, he saw the message and he didn't respond. So I know that something is wrong. I sent to other friend of him, Hamad, and I told him, please go and check on him. When he reached him, he sent me after a few minutes, Hala, 
all Ahmed's family are ward off. 21 family members. His father, his siblings, sisters and brothers, his in-laws, and 14 nieces and nephews, all below the age of 13. And this is the type of tragedy and genocide that we're living in our life. Every single day, every single second, this could be any of us, because Israel is determinant to intentionally eradicate all Palestinians and again to steal and annex their land as they did in 1948 and the people granted them a state. Well, what you're just saying there, uh, Hala, it's uh, not an isolated uh, example. Uh, many families have been deleted uh, from the register since October 7th. It is absolutely unbelievable. Um, we thought that, uh, you know, the great powers would step in to, you know, hit the brakes on this after the first few weeks, uh, but that didn't happen. Um, so it's just uh, shocking beyond belief. And um, It's shocking look, and, yeah. like, more shocking stuff have happened. I was shocked that the world didn't stop them after the first week or something. But then on the... Um, in the middle of November, when this country, the UK, voted for ceasefire, I was shocked in the first place that they have to vote on such like very intense, like very easy to understand thing. You don't have to think it or to vote it. So you would call for a ceasefire. It's something that happens naturally. But they did. I was like, okay, a bureaucratic country. Let's go on. And then more than two thirds of them either abstained or rejected. So it wasn't voted. It was rejected as a vote. People representing the British people have rejected a ceasefire after one month and a little, uh, some days. They could have saved at least 20,000 people, but they decided to be complicit and responsible for the murder of more than 20,000 people. And it's some sh something shocking, disgusting, specifically, again, saying the British people with their goodwill going at outside each day, each Saturday, with a million people demonstrating against the genocide. However, still, the government is not supporting them and not helping them. With the wiping off of family, um, my cousin, Mohammed, um, you know, everyone in, in Rafah and in, in the south and Gaza are everywhere now because Israel have literally bombarded more than 75% of all Gaza Strip is demolished now. So whoever has had a home, they would let people stay with them, even if they had never met them or know, know them before. So my cousin had in his home, his children and also many families among them, one year and eight months old baby. She was the sole survivor from a massacre of Kishko family. Israel killed all of her family, 125 family members, parents, uncles, siblings, everyone that you can imagine. They killed all of them. This baby was found alive. She was lucky. She was then brought with someone who knew the family to my cousin's house. Just in the last week, while we were sleeping, like my people were sleeping, I usually stay on the news. I received a message from someone telling me, Hala, is the murders from your relatives? Because it's my surname. And I was so stressed. I sent my family, I sent everywhere. There is no internet, there is no communication. I couldn't reach them. But then I saw the video um, by one of the channels of my cousin crying because his two kids were severely injured and his... Um, four-year-old girl, Masa, which means a diamond, precious girl, was killed. And he was crying because he wasn't able even to give her the juice that she asked for before sleeping because there is no even food or water. So how could he bring a juice? And at the same bombardment where Masa was killed, this one year and eight months old baby, Kishko baby, was also killed. So Israel, when they don't, when, when, when they try to wipe off a family, if it didn't work well and someone survived, they would follow that survived baby until they make sure that they eradicated all the family, which is beyond terrorism. 
Yeah, absolute. Uh, also, the targeting of people, of families, of journalists, even uh, of yes. medical workers, of doctors, nurses, and uh, it is just unconscionable on a level that uh, we have not seen them. before. Kidnapping them. Israel is kidnapping doctors. Israel is kidnapping families. They are kidnapping children, and unfortunately, unfortunately, they are kidnapping babies and children, and we don't know who's taken there. In one of the instances, a Israeli soldier um, kidnapped a baby girl, and we only knew because his friend on the Israeli radio channel called and said this soldier had actually, after killing the parents of the baby, brought this baby girl to Israel, back to Israel, like it's it's something normal. And this one, we knew about her, but Israel have never announced anything about her. We don't know what happened to her, if she was killed, if she's tortured if that soldier was a pedophile because Israel has a very high record of pedophiles running to the Israeli haven so she, she might be abused in so many ways and we only knew about her because his friend said it so we don't know how many other children are actually kidnapped by Israeli soldiers taken to Israel and we have no idea about them because the parents were killed and no one else was there to witness there are others, more, more babies who are kidnapped. Among them, um, a girl called Hint, Hamada. We're not sure if she's kidnapped or not, but two days ago, so 40 hour, 48 hours at least ago now, uh, the Red Christian Society have received a phone call from a girl called Leanne Hamada, and she told them that they were evacuating in Gaza uh, in their car, her parents and their four siblings um, and Hint. And she was telling them, please evacuate us. We're, we're, we're surrounded by tanks and they're, they're shooting everywhere. Uh, and they killed my father, my mother, and my siblings. Just on the call, you would be hearing the, the shoots and the screaming of Layan, a 15-year-old child. And you would know that she was killed. And then her sister, Hint, six-year-old, she called the, um, the phone. And she told the one on the Red Cross um, a Crescent phone that she's so scared and she needs someone to, um, to evacuate her. And they have killed everyone in her car and she's alone and she needs someone to take her out. Um, she said, Palawani, so take me out. They sent her to um, two paramedics. And since more than 80, 48 hours now, the two paramedics situation is unknown. They lost contact with them. They don't know if they were able to reach the girl where they were killed and sniped by the Israeli occupation because they have done that a lot. More than 300 medical uh, professionals have been killed addressing their own coats and professional uh, vests. And uh, the girl, six-year-old girl who, was, who witnessed the murder, execution of all of her family and sister, is either taken by Israel, killed after that, or just left there crying on her killed family around her. Well, the so story it's not of just the... kidnapping, but they are also torturing children in ways of... I, I, I can't describe how outrageous and disgusting is that to be done for a child. No child, no human ever should live anything of what we lived in those four months and even the last 75 years of our lives. No one should do it. No one should live it. And no one should allow it to happen. But governments does. They allow Israel to do that to us. It's going to affect them for years and generations to come, no doubt, uh, and not in necessarily in a positive way. Um, Hala Henina, I really appreciate you coming on to today's news talk this week. Uh, this is an ongoing crisis. Um, we hope to stay in touch with you uh, for more updates. Uh, do share uh, your, we'll share your tweets as well and the information that you're putting out. Uh, we've also linked uh, to uh, uh, Hala's Twitter account, X Twitter account, uh, at 21 Wire in our show post. You want to give her a follow on social media. Keep an eye on what she's posting. Uh, it's very good information and uh, it's a very dire situation, folks. Um, Hala, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me and thank you so much, everyone. Please keep your hard work. We need it. And we need to put pressure over the governments. Thank you. 
ceasefire now. Definitely ceasefire now. This is long overdue. Hala Hanina, a great segment. Uh, really appreciate her uh, as well with those insights. Look, let's take a brief break here with the network and come back with Basil Valentine on the other side. I'm Patrick Henningsen, your host. We'll be right back. From weather and traffic reports to news of political developments, we turn to journalists for the information we need to live our daily lives. Journalists around the world provide the news that is essential for democracy, for personal freedom, and for safety and stability. Yet their ability to report freely and safely is under attack like never before. So many journalists are paying with their lives. They face exponential risks and they've already paid a heavy toll. Death threats, online harassment, and physical attacks are becoming a daily experience of journalists in all countries. We just want people to be safe, to be able to get our readers the information that they need to make informed decisions. They checked my phone and realized that it was Pegasus. I feel myself like I'm naked at this street. These charges were politicized from the start. Facts win. Truth wins. Justice wins. C'est énorme pour moi d'être là, d'être libre. Surtout que je m'y attendais pas du tout. Stand with the free press. Stand with journalists whose reporting won't be silenced. Press freedom is your freedom. 